Hi, in this video, I'm going to talk about muscle property changes in strength training. Um, so first we have muscle fiber cross-sectional area. Uh, so muscle fiber cross-sectional area increases in response to strength training. Uh, so that's largely where hypertrophy happens is by the muscle fibers increasing in cross-sectional area. Uh, type two fibers increase to a greater extent than type one fibers, but both are capable of hypertrophy. Um, there's greater hypertrophy in response to heavier resistance and to eccentric actions compared to concentric. Uh, there's less hypertrophy from faster contractions, lighter loads, or if there's training without eccentric actions, which is actually quite difficult to do, but uh, it is possible. So if you remove the eccentric actions from the workout, uh, then that results in less hypertrophy. So less hypertrophy from faster contractions and lighter loads, that means that like plyometric training um, and explosive training where you necessarily have to use lighter loads because you are contracting at a faster rate, uh, that is going to result in less hypertrophy. Other benefits for sure, but less hypertrophy. Um, the hypertrophy occurs quickly, so within a few weeks of beginning a training program, there starts to be a pretty substantial amount of hypertrophy. And protein supplementation immediately before and after training sessions results in larger training-induced hypertrophy than uh, carbohydrate supplementation. So when we compare carbohydrate versus protein supplementation before and or after a strength training session, uh, protein far exceeds the benefits in terms of strength gains and hypertrophy compared to carbohydrates. Uh, so fiber type and muscle composition. Um, so if the proportions change of fiber types within a muscle, uh, the most common change would be a decrease in type 2B fibers and an increase in type 2A fibers. Um, so the proportions don't always change, but if they do, that's the direction that they would go. Um, so type 2B fibers, they respond or we would we would move in the direction of a greater proportion of type 2b fibers with inactivity so less activity less activation would change our uh, proportions in the direction of type 2b fibers the more activation we have even if it's strength training and it's resulting in hypertrophy uh, but the more activation we have the more the muscle fibers would move in the direction of fatigue resistance because we're activating them to a greater extent. It might not be to the extent as in aerobic training, but we're still activating them more than when we're sedentary and we're not activating them at all. Um, so just as a general rule, we move more towards type 2B with disuse and we move more towards type 2A with increased use. And it'd be more toward type one with an extreme amount of increased use, like in the case of aerobic training, like somebody who's training for a marathon, they're gonna have more uh, transformation into type two, or sorry, into type one, uh, but with strength training, it'd be more into type two A. Uh, extremely hypertrophied muscle fibers are denser in myofibrillar packing and have decreased collagen and other non-contractile proteins. Okay, so we might have a change in fiber type proportions, composition of the whole muscle, uh, but then the fiber types them or the fibers, the muscle fibers themselves also are going to be more densely packed. So even if the cross-sectional area of the fiber doesn't increase, um, the strength of that fiber will still increase because there will be more myofibrils packed into a tighter space with less other non-contractile proteins taking up space within that fiber. So both take place in response to strength training. Uh, so muscle fiber number. So it is not decided whether hyperplasia takes place in a muscle or not. Um, so we do know that hyper uh, that hypertrophy happens with the individual fibers becoming larger in cross-sectional area. Um, so we do know that that takes place, but it's debated whether hyperplasia, so addition of new fibers, is taking place or not. It is not clear in the literature. There are studies in support of hyperplasia, and there are studies that say, no, there's no hyperplasia happening at all. 
Um, it's a really difficult issue to study, uh, as you might imagine, because it's hard to be able to get a, an accurate estimate of the number of fibers in a living person, um, and then to be able to measure and test that in response to different types of training. Um, so there is variable evidence. It's likely that it is happening. Hyperplasia is probably happening to a small degree. Um, but again, it is not definitive. Um, and there's a huge amount of variety from one individual to another, which makes it even more difficult to study the changes because we can't assume that on average, we have this many fibers in this muscle because it's so extremely different from one person to another. Um, so another bit here to consider is muscle cross-sectional area is more closely related to muscle fiber cross-sectional area than it is to estimated fiber number. So that fact is in support of hypertrophy of muscle fibers as opposed to hyperplasia when it comes to increasing the whole muscle cross-sectional area. Okay, muscle architecture also changes in response to strength training. Uh, the fascicular length and angle of pination both increase in response to concentric and eccentric resistance training. Um, so greater pination means greater physiological cross-sectional area with the same anatomical cross-sectional area. So pination is the angle of the muscle fibers relative to the axis of force generation. So if we look in our pictures here, like let's say here's a fusiform muscle, uh, the axis of force generation is going from one tendon to the other. So it's the direction that the, the movement or the force is going to be applied to the bone when the muscle shortens. Okay, so that's the axis of force generation. So if the fibers are going in the same direction as the axis of force generation, then it's not a pennate muscle. The, there's no angle of pennation. Uh, but in a lot of our muscles, we have pennation where here's our tendon that's running along the center of the muscle. So it's running from one bone to the other, and that's the direction of the, uh, the force, the longitudinal axis of the force. And so here are the muscle fibers that you see, it's like a feather, they're projecting off at an angle from that central tendon. So that is pennated, those fibers are pennated. So the angle of those fibers relative to that central axis, that's the angle of pination. Um, and we can have multiple um, central axis depending on uh, the origin insertion of the muscle and the design of the muscle. So like this muscle here looks just like deltoid um, gluteus media. So we have multiple muscles that are multipennate like that. And then we have many that are bipennate or unipennate. Um, so the angle of pination in pennate muscles changes in response to strength training. Um, so the angle of pination increases, which means that we're able to pack in more fibers or that those fibers can hypertrophy to a greater extent without it changing the total amount of space that the muscle actually takes up because the angle of pination has changed. Um, so let's see, physiological and anatomical cross-sectional area. So that's what PCSA and ACSA stand for. So the cross-sectional area of a muscle represents essentially the, the cross-section of all of the fibers in the muscle. So the physiological cross-sectional area is where we're taking a cross-section of all of the fibers in the muscle. So here, we can cut straight across and we're getting a cross section of all of the fibers in the muscle because they're all running the length of the muscle in this example. Here, because it's pennate, this green dotted line that goes up like this represents the physiological cross sectional area because we're trying to take a cross section of all of the fibers in that muscle. So because the fibers are going at an angle, they're pennated, we have to have our PCSA going in that direction to be able to capture all of the fibers in the PCSA. And then even more complicated over here in the multi-pennate, this zigzag uh, green dotted line, that is the PCSA. So the physiological cross-sectional area, we're getting a cross-section of all of the fibers in that muscle contributing to force generation. The anatomical cross-sectional area is simply where we just cut through the belly of the muscle and get a cross-section of that muscle. 
So here is our AUCSA, and you can see that it's equivalent, it's the same thing as the PCSA in the case that all of our fibers are running the length of the muscle. But in these two cases where the muscles are pennate, we have the ACSA cutting right through the center of the muscle, but it's significantly smaller than if we look at our PCSA for those two types of muscles. So the ACSA in a pennate muscle is always going to be less than the PCSA in a pennate muscle. Uh, so meaning that it's a smaller um, total size of the belly of the muscle, but that's not representative of the true force generation capacity of that muscle. So what we're saying here, if we go back to the second point here, greater pennation means greater physiological cross-sectional area with the same anatomical cross-sectional area. So that means that when the muscle has greater pennation in response to strength training, that we are increasing the physiological cross-sectional area, which is a representation of how much force that that muscle can produce. But the anatomical cross-sectional area is staying the same. Um, and so it's taking up the same space in the body. And so we wouldn't necessarily see any increase or change in girth of the muscle, but we are increasing in force generation capacity. High speed plyometric training causes increased fossil length, but a decreased angle of pination. Okay, so high speed plyometric training is going to train the muscles and they're going to adapt so that they can contract at a faster rate but not necessarily with as much force. Um, so we're gonna have less angle of pination, which is gonna mean less capacity for force generation, but greater capacity for speed. Um, so as a general rule, longer fibers with less pination favors shortening speed. So uh, velocity of contraction so that the contraction can happen at a faster rate. Shorter fibers with greater pination favors force development. So shorter fibers, more angle of pination, that means we're gonna have a greater PCSA and that favors force development. So as an example, to illustrate that, sprinters tend to have longer fossicles with smaller angles. Um, so that's so that we can have a faster velocity of contraction. So the muscle can contract much faster. Um, and then endurance runners tend to have shorter fossicles with larger angles um, so that they don't have to contract to as great of an extent because they have a greater capacity for force generation. Um, so they won't have to activate as much of the muscle, which is beneficial in endurance, um, in any kind of endurance activity. Okay, muscle force, velocity, and power. So a training program involving a variety of loads and velocities increases strength throughout the whole range of muscle contractile speeds. So remember, our training is always very specific. So we get better at whatever it is that we're doing in training. So if we design our training program so that we're including variety in terms of how heavy are we going, how fast are we contracting, our range of motion, our angle of uh, force generation, all these different factors when we're deciding what exercises to do and how. Um, if we maintain that variety, then we have uh, benefits that are a variety. So um, when we control speed during training, just as an example, then we have speed specific adaptations that don't apply at other uh, velocities of contraction. Explosive training enhances the performance of powerful movements because again, it's very specific to the exercises and the type of training that we do. Uh, plyometric training increases muscle power and strength, but not muscle fiber size. And as we just mentioned, it also decreases the angle of pination, with, which works against our total capacity for strength in that muscle. Um, now, it is apparent that the changes are primarily neural rather than mechanical. So in plyometric training, there aren't significant mechanical changes in the muscle tissue itself, except for decreasing the angle of pination, but that works against strength, not in favor of strength. So the increase in strength that's seen in plyometric training is more likely neural. It's more likely related to the neural effects of how we are uh, 
uh, recruiting motor units and firing rate and all of those variables rather than any mechanical changes in the muscle itself. On top of that, tendons become stiffer and dissipate less stored energy, which means that they're more efficient. So the job of the tendon is to transmit the force from the muscle to the bone that it's connected to. So the qualities of the tendons are very, very important in terms of efficiency and being able to transmit the, the tension from the muscle to the bone. So if a tendon is too loose and stretchy and not stiff enough, then when the muscle contracts and it generates force, it will simply stretch the tendon and the tendon won't transmit the force from the muscle to the bone, or maybe not entirely just doesn't transmit at all, then that would be a completely dysfunctional muscle that couldn't create any movement. Um, but if it's too stretchy and loose, we're gonna lose a lot of that force because it's not able to efficiently transmit that force to the bone. Um, so of course there's balance. We don't want tendons that are so stiff that they're injured by that muscle force or that we don't have flexibility or range of motion, but they do need to be stiff enough to be efficient in transmitting that force from the muscle to the bone. Um, so that is one of the benefits in plyometric training is that it does stiffen the tendons so that they get more efficient, which also could be where we see an increase in uh, strength and power is because even if the muscle is only capable of generating the same amount of strength and power as before, if the tendon is better at transmitting uh, that force to the bone, then we'll see an overall increase. Fatigue resistance. Um, so it's a common misconception that hypertrophy of a muscle decreases fatigue resistance, uh, but that is not the case. As I mentioned a minute ago, uh, when talking about the transformation of fiber types in response to exercise, inactivity leads us towards type 2B fibers, and strength training moves us more in the direction of type 2A fibers. Um, so even if our fibers are getting larger in response to strength training, they are becoming more fatigue resistant because we're using them more. As we increase activity, they become more fatigue resistant, not less fatigue resistant. We are not transforming into type 2B fibers in response to strength training. Therefore, we are not um, decreasing fatigue resistance. Concentric exercise is generally more fatiguing to muscles than eccentric exercise. So we can do more eccentric exercise, more eccentric work um, before we get fatigued compared to concentric exercise. Um, and that could be due to the activation patterns, because as we've talked about in past videos, uh, con concentric contractions, we recruit more of the total muscle than we do in eccentric to generate the same amount of force. Okay, that's all I have for you in this video. Thanks so much for watching.